Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Lutheran World Church in Erie, Pennsylvania. Today is uh, February 10th, 2021, and I bring you greetings in the name of Jesus. Today we will be looking at Transfiguration Sunday, which is coming up this Sunday, and uh, it is a transition period in our church calendar, and I'll be discussing that a little bit uh, in a moment. Uh, before you, as always, are the readings for this upcoming Sunday. You'll see that we're going to be reading our first lesson from 2 Kings, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. We have the story of Elijah and Elisha. And then our psalm today comes from Psalm 50, verses 1 through 6. Second reading, uh, 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. And then our gospel lesson, uh, Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, um, our readings are a little bit shorter on Sundays, mostly because we're in Mark's gospel. Um, they're just not very lengthy, although I stand corrected in our first reading today from 2 Kings. But um, they just seem to be a little bit more compact, a little bit shorter, which goes very much in line with Mark's gospel. Um, so I wanted to at least introduce uh, Transfiguration Sunday, what it is, and then I thought we would spend the majority of our time looking at Mark's Gospel because it's addressing the Transfiguration. Um, so let me get to where I need to get to, and uh, we'll begin. And I'm going to have a sip of coffee since it's not a worship service. We can pretend that we're together in a Bible study. I'm not sure if you have tea or coffee, if you like those, but uh, I'm both. I like, I like coffee, though. So, introduction to Transfiguration Sunday. The Sundays after Epiphany began with Jesus' baptism and end with three disciples' vision of his transfiguration. In Mark's story of Jesus' baptism, apparently only Jesus sees the Spirit descending and hears the words from heaven. But now, Jesus' three closest friends hear the same words, naming him God's beloved. As believers, Paul writes, we are enabled to see the God light in Jesus' face, because the same God who created light in the first place has shown in our hearts to give us that vision. The light of God's glory in Jesus has enlightened us through baptism and shines in us also for others to see. Uh, that what I read will be on the front of our bulletin um, as that introduction. I'm not sure how much you spend time reading the rubrics, but um, I, I do feel um, not proud. That's not the word, but I, I'm I'm um, I really like our worship bulletin. Um, as you know, we we have a worship bulletin that contains the entire service. I think it's uh, good for many reasons. Um, one of them, especially if we have guests or people new to the faith or to the Lutheran Church, um, everything that they need to know is right there before them. Uh, so it, it provides an easier access into ministry. The other nice thing is that um, although we have a very structured liturgy, uh, you'll notice that every Sunday there's some things that are a little bit different. Um, of course, the readings and the prayers, but, um, you know, ways of... of um, Ways of explaining things, um, words of our confession, forgiveness, um, you know, uh, moderation or variation within our prayers, uh, adding things that are specific to our local context. You know, and I, I think that's important. Um, sometimes I've been part of churches that uh, it's just so rote. I mean, there's, there's nothing that's being added that might speak specifically to a specific moment. Uh, so I, I do um, like that. Also, I, I really like the commentaries, the rubrics uh, that Mark Lechner and Walt Gaber provide introducing hymns. That uh, introduction statement on the front of the bulletin describes what the day is about. We also have the introductions to the readings. Um, and then uh, also pay attention to the four parts of our liturgy. Um, they're, they're broken out. So there's four parts. We have the gathering the word, the meal, and the sending. Um, that is a liturgical form, an ancient liturgical form 
that uh, that that we adhere to, and that is what um, that's what a worship service is. Now there may be some variation within those, uh, but that is the core. That is the foundation of our worship life together. Um, so let's talk a little bit. I'd, I'd like to go back uh, to hear what the saints have to say about a particular day. And this comes from John Chrysostom. Uh, this comes from his Sunday Sermons of the Great Fathers. Um, he says, Christ brings before the disciples the one who had died and the one who had not yet died. Both had lost their life and had found it. Both had courageously withstood a tyrant, one the Egyptian the other Arab. Both were simple, unlearned men. One was slow of speech and weak of voice, the other a rough countryman. And both were men who had despised the riches of the world. For Moses possessed nothing, and Elijah had nothing but his sheepskin. Christ brought these men before the disciples, for he wished them to imitate their courage of soul and their steadfastness in leading their people so that they might be as gentle as Moses and possess the zeal of Elijah and as devoted as both were. He brought these men before them in glory that the disciples might surpass them, that Christ might uplift their courage against all such dangers. He here brings before them these two men who were such shining lights of the Old Testament. Uh, really a marvelous reflection, and I trust that it will deepen our worship on Sunday as we hear the lesson we hear about Moses and Elijah to think of the type of, of men that they were um, and their characteristics and that Jesus chooses them, God chooses them uh, to be there with Jesus and to be transfigured. So uh, thank you for those words from uh, the ancient fathers and mothers. All right, I'm going to read the Gospel from Mark, and then I'll discuss, I added some rather lengthy things there for your review, but let's uh, read the Gospel, and I'm going to read the introduction. Mark's Gospel presents the Transfiguration as a preview of what would become apparent to Jesus' followers after he rose from the dead. Confused disciples are given a vision of God's glory manifest in the Beloved Son. Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved, listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them any more, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what, what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. All right, a little bit of background information about Mark's Gospel. Um, you'll notice that we are in chapter 9. Um, previous Sundays we were early on in Mark's Gospel. Um, but we, of course, jumped ahead to pick up the transfiguration of Jesus. Um, so, a little bit of background in Mark's Gospel. Uh, many of you will know this, but it always bears repeating. The writer of this Gospel, according to tradition, is Mark. And Mark is a companion of Peter and Paul. And this is mentioned, I want you to write these down if you have a, I'll give you a minute, uh, paper and pen, so that you can go back and check these references. That's always neat. Um, so this companionship of Peter and Paul is mentioned in Acts chapter 12, verse 12, uh, Acts 12, verse 25, uh, Acts 15, 37 through 39, Colossians chapter 4, verse 10, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, 
and Philemon 24. Okay, so you can go and do some additional research uh, after this Bible study. Um, now, this Gospel lesson of Mark, um, uh, who would have written in Rome during, you know, during the 60s, it's, it's believed 60s uh, CE, um, but we cannot be certain of this claim, but evidence from the Gospel itself suggests that it was written for a community of Christians situated within the Roman Empire but outside of Palestine sometime around or a little bit before the destruction of Jerusalem in the temple in 70 CE. Uh, as you Bible students know, it is believed that Mark was the first gospel lesson that was written down and um, that makes a lot of sense in some ways, the brevity compared to Mark and Luke. And then, as you know, um, it's believed that the writers of Luke and Matthew's gospel would have had perhaps Mark's gospel before them, and then um, based upon their community, based upon additional stories, uh, would have built around that core foundation provided by Mark. Um, as we hear Mark's gospel on Sunday, I really want you to grab hold of the importance and uh, how profound it is uh, what Mark did. Um, to think about trying to get that story started, um, you know, to try to take all of this stuff that you're hearing and that you've witnessed and then to, you know, to get that down on paper or scroll, um, to, um, you know, to have that. It's really remarkable. Um, a little bit easier for Luke and Matthew in some sense because they had, they had a foundation to build upon. But, you know, to build that foundation, I really commend Mark um, for what, he was able to do. Uh, and then, of course, we have John. Uh, John is a little bit outside, doesn't really follow, um, uh, you know, those patterns of, of Mark, uh, Matthew, and Luke. It's sort of its own its own gospel. Uh, there are some connections, of course, <laughs> but, um, you know, John, John is just slightly kind of off to the side a little bit. Uh, certainly not, not less important, though. Now, um, <laughs> When I was preparing for this Bible study, I wanted to give you an outline of Mark's gospel because I really like outlines. When I read or before I read a book, I immediately go right to the outline or the contents because um, not that I want to know the end of the story before I begin it, but I do like to see sort of the structure, um, some of the things that the author will be discussing um, so I can be more attentive uh, in my reading. Um, I also very much like each Sunday to know where the particular gospel lesson we're going to be hearing falls within the larger gospel narrative itself. What, again, comes before, what comes after, um, because all those things, I, I do believe, uh, lead us to a further understanding of what's being said within the gospel. Um, so as I got started looking for different outlines um, in Mark's Gospel, I came across one that was provided uh, through the website Bible.org. And uh, as I got started with it, I realized how lengthy and how detailed it is. <laughs> um, it's almost a little bit, I don't want to say too much, uh, but what I then am sharing before you, there's a lot there. It was not my intention, but I'd rather share extra with you than not enough, and then you can delete or avoid what it is that you're not interested in. So before you is the outline of Mark, and you're going to see that it's broken off um, into um, uh, seven different sections. Okay, those are indicated by the bolded red text. Um, we, you know, we have the very familiar the beginning of his servant ministry, uh, chapter one. Now, uh, no birth story there, right? Uh, he just begins right off the bat. Our birth stories come from Luke and Matthew. Then in section two, we move to the servant's ministry in Galilee. So a particular place. Where is Jesus doing? Well, first of all, what is he doing? He's beginning his ministry. And two, where is he doing it? He's doing it in Galilee. And if you don't know where Galilee is, just Google that. and You'll see it's up in the northern part um, around the Sea of Galilee. Okay. Uh, three, the servants withdrawals from Galilee, a little bit of time away. 
which is uh, one of those permission giving moments that uh, even Jesus needed time to be away and to pray and to be quiet and to recharge. And uh, so that's permission that, that we're given as a model that sometimes that happens in life. And four, revelation of the servant's suffering at Caesarea Philippi. All right, so again, we have a specific place. Where is that? If you do not know where that is, Google that or look in your Bible studies or your Bibles if it has a map in it. Five is the suffering servant's journey to Jerusalem. So there is definitely that moment. You have that ministry in Galilee, Caesarea Philippi. He's doing all these things. And then in chapter 9, now this is the movement towards Jerusalem. And uh, post-crucifixion post or resurrection, we know where he's moving to. Uh, the disciples don't quite get it. And that's part of the, the joy of Mark's gospel, uh, how obtuse the disciples can be, which again gives us permission and understanding for our obtuseness. Um, but chapter 9 is an important mark, mark in Mark as he's moving to Jerusalem. More about that later. And 6, the suffering servant's ministry in Jerusalem, right? So another particular place. You might not have really thought about what towns and locations he's in, but that does add to a level of understanding of what's happening within a particular gospel. And then uh, seven, you have the culmination of the suffering servant's ministry. You have the death and resurrection from 14.1 through 16.8. Uh, 16, so uh, why am I giving that to you? Well, because right now as we study our lesson today, where is our lesson found? What chapter? And you say chapter 9, and you say, oh, let's see, where is this within Mark's gospel? Oh, it's in section 5, uh, the suffering servant's journey to Jerusalem. So where is he in this lesson for Sunday? And you answer, he is making his way to Jerusalem. Now, you know, I mean, how does that help? Well, it probably may not help everybody, but it's helped me to think about that before he makes his movement, or before, um, yeah, as he's making his movement to what he knows will happen, he is first strengthened through this transfiguration. He has this uh, amazing connection with the Father. And so it is a moment of glory, a moment of filling up one's tank, perhaps, um, to be prepared for what awaits him. Um, and you know, that, that's, I think we can all certainly understand that when we have something hard before us, what do we do? We try to fill up, we try to prepare, we try to, um, fill up our souls so that we could, uh, carry, carry those burdens. Um, and, and that's what's happening here. So to me that, that added something to my understanding as I hear this text on Sunday. Um, so, uh, further, uh, further indicated in, in section 5. Then we also have in section 5 uh, the lessons uh, in Galilee. Okay, so, um, and then he's, you know, you can see him making his movement. Lessons in Galilee as he's making his way to Jerusalem. Where is he? He's in Galilee. He's making his way south. And then uh, lessons in Judea. Uh, uh, and then, uh, you know, all those different lessons there that I'm not going to read all of them to you. Uh, so in our lesson today, he is, um, still in Galilee, traveling, beginning his travel towards Jerusalem. You can see that in A1, the transfiguration, 9, 1 through 13. Now, as that follows through, what, so what comes after our lesson for Sunday? Well, you can see these different things that he's doing, um, after the transfiguration. He's healing of a demon-possessed boy. He makes his second prediction of his death and resurrection. And then, you know, you can kind of read the confusion of the disciples, like, what's going on? He makes three predictions, three, and they're still not getting it. Um, you know, that then moves into the greatest disciple discussion, which might be familiar to you. You can read all this stuff, doing good in Jesus' name, stumbling blocks, and worthless salt. All right, so that was a huge setup. 
um, f for what I just wanted to raise a couple items for a transfiguration text itself. Um, some of the notes that I'll be sharing are my own notes, uh, but also some notes from somebody who I've shared before, uh, Brian Stoffergen. So always try to be clear uh, where I'm getting some of these resources from. So thank you to Brian. Now let's talk just about a few topics that Brian raised and then I wanted to end up where I see some things and perhaps where I'm moving towards in the proclamation on Sunday. Um, this is a season of bookends. Okay, so where are we in the church year? Well, let's think about it this way. Both last Sunday... Um, or for this upcoming Sunday, uh, the Transfiguration of Jesus. And, of course, we had uh, first Sunday, the Baptism of Jesus. After the Epiphany are the text where God, a voice from heaven, makes Jesus' known to the world. So Epiphany, the season of Epiphany, um, is the, the word Epiphany means to make known. So... Um, after the Christmas season, we moved into Epiphany, and we're, we're ending, right, we're ending Epiphany, uh, because uh, Wednesday after this Sunday is Ash Wednesday, and then we begin the season of Lent. So we are at the bookend of the season of Epiphany, and the point of the Epiphany season, whether you knew this or not or need to be reminded, is to make uh, Jesus known. So I would certainly think that at least for the ones, um, those disciples who witnessed it, although they're confused about it, they're starting to, you know, um, things are being made known to them. Now, let's talk a little bit, too, about uh, this whole thing with six days after. Mark indicates that this event took place six days after something. Uh, Luke has about eight days and that's in Luke 9.28. So I don't know if you just passed over that, but uh, that this took place six days after something. Uh, presumably, it refers to those events that started with Peter's confession at Caesarea Philippi and Jesus' first passion prediction, which happened in Mark 8.27 and then a few verses throughout. Okay. So remember, as I shared, um, it's an important part of Mark's gospel, these passion predictions. And there's the three passion predictions. The first one was in Mark 8. And then um, we saw on our, on our text, I'm going to skip back up real fast uh, to our outline. Uh, that was in um, Mark 9, right? Uh, yeah, 9, 31 through 32. Okay, uh, and then we have another passion prediction in um, Mark 10, 32 through 34. Okay, and I'm just making sure I, I didn't misspeak. I, I think in Mark's gospel, there's the three passion predictions. At least that's what was in my mind. But sometimes the problem is you're jumping between gospels. Um, so I'm pretty sure that there's three. And if I'm wrong about that, tell me, and I apologize. Um, but uh, it's always good to admit sometimes where you need to double check because I do not want to be incorrectly teaching anything. Um, okay, so let's let's uh, let's keep moving on to. Um, so so you know again, just notice that six days. Now, why you know whether we can figure out what what comes after or what is that marker that this happens six days after that sort of open. Um, but why even bring it up? Why even bring up this six days? Well, uh, it's noted by Brian Stafferton. He says that this is perhaps a connection with Moses, the mountain from Exodus. This was interesting in Exodus 24, 15 through 16. And that text says, then Moses went up on the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. I never knew that. I never made that connection before. That was very interesting and well done by Brian. So, you know, uh, I think that's a pretty reasonable um, 
course, Mark knows these scriptures. So, uh, and, and numbers are important. Um, sometimes there's people that make way too much of numbers, um, but there are, there are important numbers and they, and they do, they are meant to connect us to some other part of scripture. I, I, I do believe that. Um, so let's talk, um, one final point, and then I'm going to move into a couple of my thoughts about the inner three. This is kind of cool. This is the second time the inner three are set apart in Mark. They witness the raising of Jairus' daughter from the dead in beginning in Mark 5, 37. It is then ironic that these three question what the rising from the dead could mean. So they question that in uh, nine, Mark 9, 9 through 10. Um, so again, you know, they already saw this happening, this raising of the dead, and then they're questioning, well, I don't get it, right? But they, they, they were witnessing it. And I, I really love these, um, these, I really love these disciples. You know, sometimes there's a real critical nature or, you know, we kind of criticize them. They're like, how can you be so stupid? You know, I mean, you're, well, golly jeepers. It's so great that Mark gave these, I think, honest witnesses to these people. Because it just makes me feel better when I am not getting it or I can't see. Um, I mean, these three are right there with him and they are having trouble seeing. So that kind of, you know, it doesn't excuse my bad behavior, but it at least makes it more understandable. And I shouldn't beat myself up too bad about it. Um, now, the next time that Jesus takes these three with him, and this was another great note, is in the Garden of Gethsemane in 1433. Isn't that cool? So the three who have seen his power to raise the dead, who have seen his heavenly glory, also see his earthly agony. In these two instances, they especially, Peter, respond poorly. On the mountain, Peter wants to build booths. In the garden, they are to stay awake and pray, but remember, they fall asleep three times. So again, another failure. Um, but I love those connections that Brian made to where these three are in these different moments of Mark's gospel. I thought that was a really good, a very good study. Now, a couple of final thoughts that I wanted to share. Um about Mark's gospel. I, I'm, I'm just looking at the text, seeing what it is that we sort of covered um, and to sort of recap. So again, if, if you have the text before you, you'll notice you see that six days later. I guarantee before I studied this text, when I first read Mark's gospel on Monday, I just skipped right over six days. I mean, I read it, but I didn't even think. Six days later, blah, 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 right? But now I'm like laser focused on six days later because now I believe that there's that connection back with Moses. So that adds a real depth to the text. Jesus takes him with Peter, James, and John. Now we know what? The inner three. We know they are there for the raising of uh, Jairus' daughter and that we know they were with him in the garden. So right there, those couple words, we've just, we've done some deep, deep dive study. Uh, led them high up on a mountain by themselves. Um, you're familiar with this. The mountain would be the place where, you know, people go up uh, for God. A mountain is where revelation happens. There's another connection with who? With Moses. That's right. Good job. See, I know you're answering these things. Transfigured before them. Uh, what does it look like? It sort of reminds me of Paul. Paul's letters when he is uh, trying to describe something of God to enter into God's glory. Uh, Paul, you know, it's certainly Revelation will say, uh, this looked like something like this. It, it's just, there's no words for it. Um, so his clothes became dazzling white. That's the best description. Um, you know, no one on earth could even bleach them this white. And there we have now Elijah with Moses. We talked about um, of all the people to have. Moses and Elijah are just true servants. 
And so as these disciples are there, they, they're, um, they're seen. This is who Jesus decides to spend time with, these servants of God uh, that would have been cast aside. But these are the ones who Jesus uh, is with in conversation. Uh, And then we have Peter saying to Jesus, Rabbi. Now, notice that the word rabbi, that's not something we should skip over. Rabbi uh, means teacher. Um, But there are many rabbis and many teachers. Uh, At this point, uh, he is not called Messiah. They just don't have that ability to do it. Um, They're still, he's making these passion predictions. How many in Mark's gospel? Three. Yes, very good. I know. You're talking. I can hear you. Um, but notice his, his way of addressing. He doesn't say Messiah, which is, or Son of God, which is the, um, the ultimate statement of faith. What does he say? Rabbi. He's not there yet. Um, it is good for us to be here, right? We have those dwellings. We have the booths. Um, uh, but now, you know, he doesn't know what to say. But he's going to speak anyway. Another lesson, if you don't know what to say, keep your mouth shut. And uh, any time that that humans come into the glory of God, uh, the Hebrew word is kavod or kavad, um, the glory, there is what? Terror and fear. Um, That very much matches up. The cloud overshadows them. Where's the deal with the cloud, right? Moses, mountain, we got this, all these great connections, and there comes this voice. This is my son, the beloved, listen to him, exclamation point. Now, listen to him is an imperative, and they actually translate it very well in the NRSV. You can see there's an exclamation point. There is an imperative. Um, But what you can't see very well is that there, uh, there's an imperfect nature to that imperative. So you have an imperfect imperative. Imperfect means is that it is, um, it is something that is, is, is taught and, who's a, and it continues to be um, something that needs to happen. So we don't just listen once, but it's a continuation of listening. It, it doesn't, it's not like just a past tense. He listened and then that's it. Listening was listening. Um, so that, you know, so this is what we're doing today. We, we are, uh, in our very best way, continuing to listen to him through this study. And then, um, just to wrap up a little bit more, as they were coming down the mountain, right, Jesus ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Um, I just love that coming down the mountain. There is that, what I said before, as we looked at the larger context of Mark's gospel. He comes up the mountain, and he's re-enlivened, recharged, but he's got to come down. He's got to come down the mountain to do his work. He would have probably preferred to stay up the mountain, um, but he knew that he needed to do this. This was his ministry. So I can, I don't know if he comes down kind of like, oh boy, here we go. (laughs) Uh, Who knows, uh, those types of things. But, you know, not a very long gospel lesson, but it is jam-packed. Mark Mark really used every word uh, very well in his gospel. It's not a large gospel, but what he shared uh, has a lot of impact, and uh, which is why uh, Mark's gospel continues to be one of my favorite. So uh, that was a lot today. Um, I feel really good about what it is that we discussed and shared. As always, if you have any comments or questions, please um, email them to me or however you want to get in contact with. Uh, I continue to remind all of us, um, I am here uh, for you. Um, I I feel it difficult to to make so many phone calls, just not knowing who to reach out to at times. Sometimes people's faces pop into my head and I'll reach out to them but a reminder that a relationship is a partnership. And so if there's something that's weighing on you or you just want to talk, um, please don't hesitate to give me a call, okay? So that was a little bit of an announcement. Uh, Thank you for being here and um, talk to you soon. Bye-bye.